Howdy, folks. Uh, I'm just going to give a couple of minutes of uh, biographical information about myself. Hi, my name is Christian Crossclair. Uh, I know some of you. I hope to know many more of you. Uh, I've been doing this since uh, late 2004. Uh, I come into this, uh, the research end. Uh, I used to translate um, poetry, medieval poetry, and religious texts before my. Um, my translations of um, into the German texts for, for combat, um, and all of this was sort of amateur base. I, I do not have a degree in anything, uh, but in my day job, uh, I do work with language. I work in software. I do uh, lots of work with natural language generation, and uh, in working in comparative te uh, texts and translation. Specifically in things like patents, where transfer, um, where transformation of meaning and, um, and those sort of connections are really important. Uh, I, I've had to do a ton of research uh, in linguistics to support my uh, my professional work, uh, and a lot of this has come in to um, to sort of help me out uh, on this uh, HEMA endeavor. Um, and I do want to point out that I am an amateur, uh, passionate, um, and I found uh, many things uh, like uh, int interesting documents that have been scanned in by Google and the University of Michigan and their uh, project. Um, and uh, there's some really amazing stuff to be found if you're, if any of you are interested to learn how to sort of research and uh, delve into the, the Google Books thing. I found. Uh, almost two years ago now, a 1603 manuscript um, whereby we think it was written by a woman, a uh, fencing treatise, uh, and it has the earliest known treatise on um, the doctrine of self-defense. And this was written in both uh, German and I believe New Latin. I handed it off to, since it was outside of my specialty, I handed it off to uh, an actual PhD, and it's a big find, and hopefully that'll be, the translation of that and presentation of that will be coming out in the next year or so. Um, but these things, are there are still things getting scanned in every day, and it's really worth people just kind of doing random searches in Google to see what you can find out. Um, and uh, all of you have the opportunity to help in the research effort, even if it's just identifying texts that some people know about and other people don't. Uh, it, it's, it's good to keep these the, the knowledge of these things uh, kind of percolating through our culture. So I highly recommend everyone sort of chip in and, uh, and help the research effort. Um, so yeah, I've been doing this since 2004. Uh, primarily work in the Lichtenauer tradition. Uh, I do read widely. Uh, across, uh, I read the Italian stuff, uh, Spanish, uh, even good old George Silver, uh, and uh, the much beloved. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm not an um, ageist. I think the 16th century is just as interesting as the 15th century, and uh, I don't actually believe that 16th century Lichtenauer is perverse and not as pure as 15th century. I just want to lay those cards. Right on the table uh, for anyone. Um, so, what this is about, um, this, there's this um, 16th century manuscript um, by, um, that is a recension of um, the Ringek manuscript. Now, uh, I think the earliest Ringek we have is um, 1507, 1505, 1504, somewhere around there. In that first decade of the uh, 16th century, even though we know Ringneck was likely alive in the 15th. Unless you count Spire. Uh, unless we count Spire. That is, in fact, correct. Um, thank you, Michael Chidester. Um, <laughs> the, so, yeah, um, and now that he completely derailed my brain, let me pull it back. So, yeah, um, so. This text is dated uh, 1539, uh, just in the very opening lines uh, of the, the text. It was um, compiled by our uh, best HEMA pal, uh, Paulus Hector Meyer. Um, 
who collected all the best things. Uh, sadly, this manuscript, like all of our best manuscripts in the Lichtenauer tradition, is unfinished. Uh, thank you, 3227A. Um, let's see. Uh, and it only gets so far as uh, the very label of uh, here are the plays for Silken. So um, we only have a partial copy of this, and um, the, the manuscript has a bunch of um, interesting uh, divergences from what is quote unquote canonical to what most people understand and know as a looking art tradition. And uh, also is inserted Hans Metal's uh, Seven Stances of the Sword, which is actually, uh, while very interesting, is not the actual focus of this lecture. Uh, where he lays out, um, uh, hey, you can just hang out in this position, and if a person attacks in this way, you can handle it in this way. So those of you um, are uh, familiar with uh, more of the Bolognese style, it's kind of similar to that. Um, let's see. Uh, so what I want to do is, um, so in the, the practicum for this class, uh, we're going to go and beat each other up with Crump House and Smirk House and a couple other little things, odds and ends. So I'm going to go kind of go through the manuscript and kind of point out some of the interesting divergences and sort of um, the, the interesting points of view on the text, that on the original text that this manuscript sort of um, points out. A lot of people either don't know about him or eschew him because... Um, he is quote unquote heredoc, 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 by the uh, 15th century purist um, long, uh, looking our longsword crowd. But uh, I think this is right over the plate. And if you all just kind of relax, it'll be it'll be fun, interesting, and a, there's a bunch of great stuff in here. So we're going to start off with the very introduction. Um, Johannes Lichtenauer's Spencer Life. Here the Zettel begins, in this, the knightly art of the longsword lies written, in which Johannes Lichtenauer, who was a great master in the art, composed and created. God have mercy upon him. He had let the Zettel be written down and composed with cryptic and misleading words, so that the art shall not become common. And so Master Sigmund Einringek, uh, who was known at this time to be a fencing master to the highborn prince and noble lord Albrecht, Falsgraf of the Rhine, and Herzog of Bavaria, had these same cryptic and misleading words settled, glossed, and interpreted, apparently completely undoing Lichtenauer's uh, will, uh, as lay written here in this book, so that any fencer who can otherwise fight properly or well uh, can see and understand well, and also, uh, and also after that, expanded and improved by other masters, uh, especially via Master Hans Metal of Sal Salzburg, uh, which subsequently follows after this. And that's the, the seven stances of the long story. Um, so what do I want to say about this? Um, so this comes from Ringick, the Anointed, and was expanded and improved by a bunch of idiots. Who are, and who are these idiots? Well, if we look at the text, here, there's some clearly egomaniacal jerk named Hans Silkthread, or Satan Fodman, and some drunkard named Hans Metal, who by best research was possibly a sommelier, or a winery, for someone who grades wines. A burger of Salzburg, and was one of the uh, one of a sizable delegation to some lordly schmuck named King Maximilian to clear up some squabbling between squabbling between some German knobs, and not to mention a Grieswartel, which is kind of like a, a judge, in, a referee in a fight, who presided over, the uh, over a judicial combat for said knobs. So, all right, uh, Hans Silkthreads, Hans Sagenfeiden is uh, one of the named people in the Gesellschaft Lichtenauer. Uh, he does not have an extant manuscript, but there are some plays by him uh, that, are, that are named by him um, in this manuscript. So this, this uh, dips back into the 15th century. Um, and then we have this interesting information about this guy named Hans Metal. Um, I, I've done some research, and uh, we have some textual evidence, and it's not like 1,000% uh, completely sure that this is the same person, but I have the records of a Hans Metal who was given uh, his burger rep in Salzburg in 1475, 
And the same person uh, was uh, given, uh, was part of a delegation um, for a legal process uh, to, between two nobles that, had, that did an entire event in front of Maximilian. And, uh, and, because he, uh, and the reason why he was in this was because he was a Schirmmeister and was the Grieswartel, or the, essentially the referee for this judicial combat uh, that happened. And I don't know exactly what happened during it, but I'm still doing research on that. So that's still in process. And is it our same Hans Metal? Maybe. But uh, there's a lot of constant uh, evidence that, uh, that's, that's pointing towards it. Um, so uh, this manuscript was written down in 1539. We have somebody who could probably in his 20s was given uh, legal status. Uh, so uh, in 1475, that, that he could have been in his 50s in 1501 and, it, and been around. It's plausible that his, his work um, you know, was written down by somebody else. And there's actually things in the text that speak about Hans Metal in the third person, so it probably wasn't him writing it down. Okay. Um, so this was somebody cataloging this thing. Uh, so I think there's enough there to say that, hey, look at our people, you should really be looking at this text. It's really interesting. Um, so, me. what do I want to do? Um, I don't want to go through regular expressions, but okay. So, um, so a lot of the, a lot of the Domino layer ends up being, I don't want to know too much, um, I think we have to set up, but we're going to have to do like where you're lecturing right now. Yeah, do don't start? worry about it. We're, 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 we're fine, we're fine. Yeah. All right. Pull my brain back together. Um. Oh yeah, and sorry everyone, I've got long COVID and I, I was sick all last week and so I'm like running on, a, on an empty tank so there's going to be some sort of lost words and lost trains of thought through here so I apologize. Um, and I may just peter out at some point and we'll just have to call it a day until I um, get more energy. Um, so what I want to do is kind of like talk you through uh, some of these passages and give you kind of my insights on them. Um, if anyone has questions, you can just go ahead and uh, raise your hand and I'll uh, ask me the question, I'll repeat the question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll dig into the text. So, does anyone have any questions based off of what I just said? Any, any of that? Any, any of that? Nope? Great. So, um, where do I want to go? The... So... I want to say that when I've done the analysis of the text, I found passages, um, this was redacted or it was a recension. Uh, for, just, a recension is uh, a reworking of a text, right? And so there are, mod, there are modern recensions and we call, generally call those like critical editions. Uh, and, uh, and then there were, there were recensions during the period. Right, and a lot of times, like we view the Lichtenauer tradition through, if you've seen the Licht on the Wittgenauer, like the the, the, the stomata trees of, of the of the Wittgenauer, of the Lichtenauer corpus, these are various recensions of the same text. Uh, sometimes they'll rewrite bits. Sometimes they'll take uh, marginalia and stick it right in the middle, right in line in the gloss, essentially glossing the gloss itself. Um, and so. Uh, I found a text that exists um, from um, von Danzig, uh, the pseudo Peter von Danzig text, as well as from the Nicholas text, um, uh, as well as from uh, the, all of the ring X that we have. So there's what? Uh, there's Rostock, Dresden, um, I'm just going to forget, so I'm not even going to try. But essentially, uh, the, 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 there's a strong, it's the strong center is from Ringek, but it's pulled a couple of phrases here and there from some of the other ones. Um, for instance, in the section where, let me find my first citation. Um, 
So we arrive at the opponent uh, with the initiation of fencing. You should neither watch nor await their cut as they conduct it against you because all fencers that watch and wait upon another's cut and wish to do nothing else than parry. They allow themselves to enjoy little of the art because they often become, become struck with it. Uh, and then this phrase gets added in there, uh, therefore cut and thrust to the openings. Um, and this is, uh, the, the openings ends up being a very important um, cornerstone of Lichtenauer's fencing. It's in fact called Blossfechten, Bloss meaning nude or uh, naked or exposed, which is, we just gen generally translate as opening. Uh, uh, I think uh, Chidester translated, and other people now have translated as exposures. Um, and the four openings are essentially synonymous to the, the four lines of modern fencing. Uh, and there's actually some textual uh, evidence that sort of give us the idea that they thought about it this way. And specifically, in the, uh, the hanging verse, uh, the, uh, the hanging comes from Zwei Geferta. Geferta means path or passages, uh, paths or passages uh, in this context. And those paths of the sword, the two paths from the ground are the two lower lines. Uh, of the uh, of the modern fencing pedagogy, um, and so and in other places they they, they hint towards uh, the usage of uh, gefertin in a similar way for the upper lines. Uh, as an aside, <sighs> let's see. Um, do, do, do. So yeah, um, so we have this reinforcement of cutting and thrusting to the openings. Great, he's a. Uh, giving us more of this Lichtenauer greatness. Um, he talks about the before and after, and um, his main addition to the, so first let me explain the before, for those of you who don't know. So from the text, the before, this means that you should always, and this is, um, and this parentheses is added by Hans Madel, if you wish, come forth with a cut or with a thrust to the opponent's opening in such a way that they must parry you. Then work swiftly with your sword uh, in front of yourself in, uh, in that act of parrying from uh, one opening to the other so that they can uh, not come with their place before you come to your place. But if they rush in on you, then come before and rush in with the wrestling or with your point. So this is saying more or less, um, try and shut your opponent down before they can get anything out deployed against you, if you wish. But if you can't or choose not to, I'll read the next, the, the next, uh, the next gloss. Well, if you cannot come into the before, and Hans Metal adds, or otherwise do not wish to take it, then wait upon the actor. And these are the breaks of all plays the, that the opponent conducts upon you. So uh, if you can't shut your opponent down, then what you need to do is, is uh, counter what they're doing and, 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 and break their structure, uh, disrupt their attacks. So, and uh, this is, again, uh, a very important thing for understanding both Hans Metal and Lichtenauer's fencing. Um, and this gives you uh, your sort of uh, raison d'etre and basic theory of, of how you're supposed to appro approach your opponent. Um, uh, we go through... Um, we go through and uh, we talk about the five cuts. And I'm gonna go, and this is another slight addition to, um, to the ring X stuff, so I'm gonna read this out to you. Note the Zettel sets down five cryptic cuts. Many that call themselves master do not know, uh, know to say that you, quote, should not teach to cut differently when from the right side against the, those that position themselves against you in defense. And if you select one cut from these five cuts, then one can connect with the first strike. Whoever can break that cut, and this is what um, Hans Metal add, and especially whatever work that comes along with it, without their harm, will be avowed by the masters of the Zettel, such that their art shall become better rewarded than any other fencer that cannot fence against these five cuts. And how you shall hew the five cuts, you shall find that in this, these same very five cuts written and taught uh, in the Zettel hereafter. So this is a thing. He, get, he, he widens the, the, uh, our textual viewpoint here. So it's, it's not only 
whoever can can break this cut, but also the subsequent uh, work behind it, because the in the Lichtenauer tradition, our initial cut from Zufecten is not the end all be all, one hit, one kill. We uh, capture our opponent's short sword, we shut them down, we work in a bind, and we continue our work till the till the, the till the uh, conflict is ended, till the creed of the war is ended. Um, so, so he's giving us a, a little extra sort of like, hey guys, it's not just the strike, it's also the work that comes along with it. So I think it's, it's worthwhile to bring that up. And he's you know, showing him that he's really centered in this, this Lichtenauer perspective. Um, let's see, where is the next thing? Um, so I want to like kind of uh, walk through uh, the raft cut, the first cut, real quick, because it's going to be very important for us to understand the um, the the chrome power and the spark power later. So, whenever the opponent will strike you from their right side to your head with a descending cut, then you cut from the right side as well with a raft cut and counter. Now. <laughs> I just want to kind of a uh, open question here. If your opponent is striking, and then you are going to do a counter cut, are you attacking in the four, or are you attacking in the knock, based off the definition that we just read? The four. The four. Okay. So we. Uh, so your opponent is attacking, and. Uh, and they are going to, so, okay, we'll take that and we'll read the rest of this thing. We'll see if that plays out. So, um, so whenever the opponent will strike you, strike you from the right side of your head with a descending cut, then you cut from your right side as well with a wrath cut and counter. And then Hans Metal adds, especially if they are soft in the usage of their sword. Um, and in the cut, the wrath, wrath point is cast in and thrust in their face. So... Um, so in this, does it sound like your opponent has uh, been stopped from bringing anything on to, into into bear in front of them, or have they been shut shut out beforehand? I'd say they, yeah, they started out attacking. You sort of shut them off with your counter. So it's kind of like you take the four at the same time that they're losing it. Or, that's kind of the way I'm reading it. But, okay, yeah. great. So um, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm not going to tell you we're wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah really so, so the thing here is if we take from a wider point of view, um, we can pull in other, other Lichtenauer texts. We're told that there's no fair sets in, in, this, in the Zornhau, right? There's no parrying going on. So we're not shutting off. We're not directly opposing their cut. So, um, so there's, that's one point. Um, two, in the uh, marginalia of... Um, in the marginalia, in um, crap, what is the name of that manuscript? Uh, in Goliath, there is uh, there's one say uh, in in den Weich uh, de uh, de Schwert, and so in, like in the in the in the the Weich, so we normally say Schweck instead of Weich, uh, so like in the softness or in the instability of the sword, so we're in. Uh, in this, the way that I read the, the Zornhau play is your opponent's attacking and you're cutting through their attack, right? And, you, and you're catching the center line and they're actually getting their sword out, but you're disrupting their cut and your point hits. And, they, and in some sense, it's an abscess and, they're, they're, and there's, uh, it gets pushed off to the side. So they actually get to deploy the cut, but you're disrupting their attack in a certain center. So for me, this is this is actually striking in the knock. Okay, so this is not shutting down your opponent before they actually uh, before they actually get anything out of the field. So uh, I think that's worthwhile to say. So and in the cut, the wrath point is cast in and thrust into their face, and if they see and recognize it and parry, so then they parry, then they parry. Uh, then abscond above, abscond is the way that I translate abbey. And so if they take off above, um, and with that strike right around, uh, and with that, you strike right around from your left shoulder to their right. And then Hans Metal 
notes that um, uh, with or using the short edge, the, the gap is narrower, the shorter or smaller, than with the other, so with the log edge. Um, in, and then you can apply the stingers, the zekwar, the biters, right, uh, to their head or the body if you can. And uh, you can completely uh, uh, abscond or take off and strike in with the long edge as well. So he's saying you could do it both ways. Uh, thereafter, warring or exiting with a cut, it's etc. So, okay, there's a lot going on here. Um, we have a, a small bit of technical information about saying, hey, we can uh, we can do abnamen with a long edge or a short edge. Is there anyone who doesn't know what abnamen is? Okay, great. Can I get a sword? Someone with a sword, stand up. Oh, yep. Actually, this gentleman right here is close. <laughs> So fine. Here. Okay. So uh, I do my, my sword how he goes to parry up. Oh, I'm hands down. Yeah, I'm gonna boom. I'm gonna come in and strike this one, right? So parry. Yep, yeah. <laughs> so boom. So at him, you can stay low. Uh, just make it easier. Boom. He's coming around the sword and striking over to the other side. That's it's taking off, absconding away. So if we do it again, but if we do it Hans Metal style. If I roll to the short edge, my blade is here, and uh, I'm already there to, to strike, as opposed to put a little pressure, boom, give me pressure, thank you. See, it's, it, it pops out, yeah, if I do it this way, give me pressure, I'm here, and it, and it just slides right behind the, the sword. So he's giving me a small technical advantage here. That, uh, and he's telling you, you could do it both ways, but the short edge is, uh, is narrow. It gives you it's a smaller opening. Thank you, sir. Um, and so, and then it continues on. You can war or you can exit with a cut. So, um, and exiting with a cut is something that you will find often in uh, Meyer, in the, in the later stuff. And it only occurs, I think, um, in the in the fifteenth century stuff, in the Camino Lair, in one place, and then also uh, later on with the hand crook in, in, uh, in the, the the pressing of the hands in, in the later section of the manuscript. So he's giving you different options of what you can do. So he's extend, expanding your technical repertoire, but he's still giving you uh, bread and butter, meat and potatoes, like an hour. Okay. So, and this is what he adds. The wrath cut is nothing other than a strong, wrathful descending cut, like a simple peasant strike, and is the coded name in the Zettel for the descending cut. The descending cut is an overhaul for, for the people who know the German. The same as with the other four cuts that will follow hereafter with their special names, so that they, along with their uh, subject matter and plays, are not public, common, to, uh, to everyone. This is really crucial from uh, an interpretive point of view. Um, if you're tr uh, my goal in studying the Lichtenauer tradition is not to center the gloss as the method of fighting. It is actually, for me, I, my goal as a Lichtenauer pra uh, uh, practitioner and researcher is to understand the zettel, the encoding of Lichtenauer is fencing. And the gloss is, is not the text. It is the thing that's pointing me to and trying to explain the text to me. So I take a moment here and talk about that. Um, so from, from the, uh, the original opening, uh, from the foreword that I read to you, Lichtenauer had, had made this poem, right, this fencing poem, and, he, and he's using these terms that were not common at the time. Uh, uh, and he, he used different words, and he, he, and he used words in different senses that, uh, to throw people off so that only people in the know would understand and be able to, to comprehend his fencing. But it was a way for him to transmit the data. Uh, it is written in the, um, in, in, with mnemonic techniques, and, um, the, uh, and it has... And uh, I've done research uh, on um, pedagogy of the period, 
um, and especially uh, Laird Dick um, in didactic poetry, um, as well as both um, uh, uh, sort of a burger uh, pedagogy, as well as the pedagogy of um, uh, from the religious sources, as well as the nobles, which is a lot of overlap there. Um, so, what do I want to say? Um, so it was written in a very specific way, and, and it's really rich, and it's really useful, and it's and it's really worth trying to memorize and understand the verse itself. Um, and, and not to simply go and think that the meat and potatoes is actually in the gloss. The gloss is like absolutely necessary to understand the verse at all, but it is, but it is not the text itself. That, that's where I'm coming from. Other people disagree. Um, the second thing I want to say here uh, is that, or one of the, the next thing I want to say here, is that these that these things in my opinion are examples and are not definitions we come we come uh when we read this text we have a lot of prejudices um coming in from it like from a 21st century point of view um there's like we all know what a textbook is right we've got uh we've got sidebars we have uh, questions in the uh we have questions at the end. We've got images with graphics or with like, like text underneath them. We've got a table of contents. Things are laid out in very neat sections. They all build upon each other. They all assume that you know either uh, nothing or you've gone through the, whatever technical material beforehand to understand this text. Um, there's an index. There's all this other stuff baked in that you've been inculcated with your entire lives that these people have only just begun to think about it because the, the, the literary, these textual traditions are just starting uh, for, for the common people. Um, so that sort of book culture is just developing. And in fact, during this period, uh, during the early election hour period, there weren't even books, right? They were just manuscripts. There weren't printed books, I should say. Um, so, there are, to take, to take a step back and go back to this thing. So the Rathka is nothing other than a strong descending cut and is the coded name of the Zettel for the descending cut, uh, so for the Oberhau. So we have five cuts in the Lichtenauer tradition. We have the Zornhau, which is the Rath cut. We have the Krumphau, which is the crooked cut. Uh, we have the Zwerkhau, which is uh, which is the cross crosswise cut, right? We have the shield how, which is the cockeyed cut. We have the shadow how, which is the, the, the you know the the barber cut, you know the barber cut, whatever. Um, the one that'll part your hair. Um, but there are also five other cuts uh, that we see in the manuscripts. Um, we see in Lignitzer, um, and and we see them in Gladiatora. We see them all over the place. And what are they? They're Oberhau, Unterhau. Middlehow, um, Vexelhow, and Sturzhow. So there are five cuts in the Lichtenauer system, and then there are five cuts in the in the, the common German fencing system. And clearly, there's no mapping between any of these, right? And so, but there is, right? And so what we have in Hans Metal is he tells us that the, the Zornhaus is, a, is an Oberhau, right? So it's a descendant cut. He tells us that the middle how, that the, uh, sorry, the middle how is a Sverkhau. He tells us uh, that the, um, the Schilhau is a Vexelhau. And he tells us, talks about the Scheitler Sturz, right? So the, the Scheitler is the Sturzhau, the plunge cut. Um, the one that's left out is the Unterhau, um, and that would map to the Krumphau. And um, I, uh, we will get to the Krumpau in, in a moment. Uh, it's actually going to be the first thing that I teach in, in the practicum. And you will see how these cuts come from and originate uh, from these five cuts. So, um, and you will also notice that for people who are in, uh, aware of uh, Lignitzer's Sword and Buckler, there are six plays in Sword and Buckler. 
five of which are those five cuts, Oberhau, Unterhau, Mittelhau, uh, Wechselhau, and Sturzhau, and then there's a wrestling play. Um, and the, the plays in Lichnitzer, are, uh, which is a sword and buckler tra treatise, yes. map on pretty closely to four of the five cuts in Hans Metis system. So, um, it's, so there's another line into the older Lichnitzer stuff, but it also widens our point of view. Okay. Um, so, we talked about examples, not definitions. So, um, so when people, modern people argue about, well, is this a crump pow, or is this a that, or is this a this, or this a that, and, and, and you're trying to apply technical, like, apply these things in a modern technical sense, is you're, you're, you're making that term do things for you that it was not intended. Like, the, um, they did not necessarily use these terms in as strict of a sense as we do. And we are, we are really doing ourselves a disservice by shoehorning these things into such technical terms. It is very rarely uh, that, that we were given explicit definitions of things. And, um, and Hans Metal is about to do just that. So, adding, absconding, absconding is nothing other than when you have bound up, uh, bound with someone from descending cuts and rise up against their sword and draw your sword up around their sword or point, then uh, to your other side or shoulder, or shoulder into another cut to their other side or opening. So, this is beautiful, right? He gives us like, it's. If anyone wants to argue about what Ab Naaman is, Hans Metal gives you a definition, right? Which is very rare, but he's telling you what you need to do is essentially rise up against their sword. If you do that, you can either go around their sword or go around their point, and you can attack either to their other side or their other opening, and you're golden. Whatever that means to you is good enough for Hans Metal. Uh, so. So that's that's nice. Um, so let's see. Um, he has a, he has a different absconding, a different ab naming, but I'm going to skip that because it's not going to help us get to the Krumpau and Sperkau. Um Let's see where am I at? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm going to make an announcement. Five minutes. Okay. Um, so I don't want to cut you off. I want you to be aware of that. Okay, great. Um, all right, so I'm going to have to, five minutes. We're going to have to blow through this. You can keep going after, but I don't want to talk over you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. All right, sorry, I'm, I'm reading through the text. Um, what is the, what is the next thing? Ah, yes, okay. So how we should break the four openings. Again, bread and butter, lift our technique. So if you bound with someone from earnest descending cuts or whatever and wish to set yourself in the opening up, in the, so in the situation, uh, they wanted to strike you, you have parried and broken them. Then if they strike back around to the other side to the uh, other opening of your head by absconding, by ad naming or whatever, then you shall break their opening again, that is, striking by doubling or mutating so that you will break the opening from one side to the other and they will be struck, and you parry and strike as one without, uh, without any harm. Okay, so this is, this is slightly different uh, from the, the, the standard Lichtenauer stuff, um, in that he's, he's saying that not only, uh, so he's giving you a setup, sorry, hold, hold on, I'm gassing up for a second. Thank you.
Okay. So the beautiful thing about this, um, he's saying that if you've bound with someone from earnest descending cuts, so if someone's really trying to get you and is really trying is really trying to murder you, right? Um, then you can then there there's stuff that you can do to 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 to, to get this get back at this person, right? And if you want to, if you want to get it, so if they're really trying to kill you, you can set yourself up so that they're going to, no matter what they do, you're going to shut them off and close off their openings. So, and this is something that Hans Metal comes back to again and again and again. So, um, so he's talking about Duplirin and Mutirin. So double. Yeah, is a way to break opponents that uh, that you've come into a bind with. And you can, the beautiful thing about this is that you can use Duplier and Mutirin from any bind. And if you take a definitional approach of what Duplier and Mutirin is in the Kishelshaft Lichnauer system, you're stuck with, a, with two very specific techniques. Do you mind uh, hopping up for a second? We're gonna get that same bind, so. We're gonna go a little higher here. Boom. So in the classical Lichtenauer stuff, uh, Duplier, so if he's strong in the bind, he has structure, I'm going to essentially come behind the sword and strike him in the head. If he is weak, I can come in and thrust down below. Right, this is very, very simple, simple things. Um, the, way, the way that Hans Metal expands this, okay, is that we make this bind, and if you're going to add names, if you're going to take back and, and, and come around your head, go around your head, make a nice, nice big thing, is that you're going to come in and wide into the ear on the other side here. So you shut them down. So, boom, and as soon as, right, boom. You come in and wide to his head, so he's shut down from that side. And if you try and go back around to the other side, you do the, you do the same thing again. You shut down, you shut him down from opening to opening. And so you can't do it. And so you can't do anything. So one more time. As soon as he starts leaving the sword, you race into the opening. Boom here, and you, and you shut it off. Right. Um, and so it, as long as your opponent has given you a good bind and it was actually trying to hit you, you'll you'll ha you'll have the ability to wind and get at their openings anytime they try and leave the sword. So he gives you he expands the idea of what Duplier and Mutirin are. They're simply methods of winding that will allow you to shut down the openings. So, and when you read the text, um, you, you find out that Duplierin is generally doubling to the same opening, and Mutirin is changing, is changing to a different opening. So the boom to here, you know, back and forth. It's almost, it's almost, the, uh, it's essentially the same, it's all winding, and all winding is the same, so the only difference here is whether you go attacking the same opening or, or going to a different one. And, and this is very similar to modern fencing with the prise de fer or the pressing of iron, right? Thank you, sir. Um, so yeah, we're, so we, we have this thing set up. Like, we make binds and we, um, we make binds and we work from binds. We, we want to shut down the opponent and um, before, like before they get out the gate, and that's the four, or we, we destroy their attacks as they're coming in, and that is, that is the knock. Um, the other thing is weak and strong. Um, I guess I'm gonna do that in my class, 
will demonstrate uh, in, in the practicum. And then, um, what else do I want to say? One of the interesting things, this is going to be the last point I'm going to go, and then, then uh, I want to break for like 15 minutes, and then we can go find a spot for my practicum. But, um, in the Krumpow, in the, in the, in the Zverkow, we start, we start by initiating a bind, and then we do a, a follow-up attack from the bind. And that bind ends up being a parry, right? And so this is functionally the same as a parry and repost system, but it is not parry and reposting in the, in the way that we normally think of. So we see in the later manuscripts, like in, uh, like in Meyer, we say that like, and it actually is also said in these manuscripts as well, there's no actual parrying going on. We're, we're parrying with our cuts, with our attacks, right? So we are, we are doing, we're doing violent parries. This is not like, like our, our, our first line of defense is, is attacking into our, our, our opponent's attack. So, so we are going to do a violent parry, detect whether, the, if we have a bind, detect whether they are weak or strong, and then make our, our, our next move based off of that. So, um, so I'm gonna read the very beginning of both of these cuts, and then I'll, I'll demonstrate a little bit of the, the, the crumb how, and then we'll, we'll break. Okay, so this is how you should cut crooked at the hands. Conduct it like this. Um, stand with your left foot forwards and hold your sword crooked. Out ahead, that is with the crossed hands, uh, out ahead to the outside with your point on the ground such that the long edge stands upward well in balance in the scales, the, the, the vaga. Uh, conduct the first play according to the text like this. So we're referring back to the text, right? If the uh, opponent initiates a cut from their right shoulder. Now, this is going to be a big pain in the ass. Uh, I'm going to do one pathway for here, um, because because people thought differently about these things. Um, they're going this uh, this author is choosing to go down. Uh, you can do A or B, then the next line, C or D, and they both. He's like you can do path one or path two, path one or path two, path one. And he's putting them sentence by sentence. So I'm going to give you path one, dealing with the overhead, not the overhead. So uh, it, it, I'll give you a couple lines afterwards, so, so, it'll, so you'll understand what I just said. But conduct the first play according to the text like this. If the opponent initiates a cut from the right shoulder, be it a dis, uh, descending cut, then uh, then indes, like now, right, step toward the opponent, step in fully into them with your right foot, and let your crossed hands um, Go up and displace their cut with your sword, with your long edge. Um, and then, uh, with your, yeah, thereafter, a uh, war and work however you wish. The, the other side is, um, if, they, if they initiate a cut from the right shoulder with a rising cut, then step in and death fully with them, uh, with your right foot, and then go up with the crooked cut. And display, uh, displace their cut uh, with uh, your point thrown out over their hands towards their left side. They're, uh, they're after uh, war and work however you wish. So what I want for you is that um, you, sir, are going to hold your sword up like this, like you're going to, boom. Okay, he's coming in to murder me. And uh, so in this, my, my left foot is forward. I'm crossed. Here, so I don't hit the table and my laptop. Um, and okay. he's actually going to be here for the mur murder me. I'm going to step up, break his sword, pull, and pull my hands down, and lay it off to his shoulder. So do that. So I'm going to come up and lay it, lay it down to the right shoulder. So it's a break and a parry. Boom, boom. So that is that. And then... Uh, I'm going to show you the, the spark house since you're already up. Be in that same position. Boom. Well, I'm going to be in the middle how, and I'm going to strike a sword. And I have a choice of either 
widening to the right side, I mean, to his left side, which is the um, which is the way that everyone knows. Or you can do what's also in the loop and do clear and come across and attack him to the to the other side. Um, thank you, sir. So I'm going to read the Zverkow play really quick. Crooked, crooked, crosswise. Ah, the crosswise cut is nothing other than the lateral cut or, or the middle how, which breaks any cut that will either arrive or will be hewn from downward, uh, above downward, or from the roof. And you shall conduct it like this stand with the left foot forward, hold your sword in the, um, in the middle how, in behind at the midsection of the waist, by the right foot or side, such the long edge is above. And when someone cleaves in from above, from the roof, to either to either the opening or the head, then step or spring right ahead towards them with the right foot and displace their cut with the crosswise cut such that it is uh, crooked, so that their cut is crooked over to your left. Uh, and then after this displacement, wind to the opening of their right side, which is foam, um, if you wish to remain inside their sword, or swift strikely around to the sword at their head to the left side with your short edge, or if it is necessary. Okay. You'll notice that for both of these, your opponent's coming in, coming to murder you with, with, a good, with a good cut to the opening, and you are stepping in directly at them into danger, and you are, you're, you're directly clashing with their weapon, and then you're following up with another attack to murder them. So that's what we're going to be doing for, for the practical. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? I know I just like rambled 80,000 lines of whatever action. <laughs> we good? All right. I have no idea where my class is going to be, so I'll have that announced. And uh, yeah. I think it said the green, the green area. The green stuff. Which is this. Green is right out there. Okay, great. Oh, okay, great. Come on.